everyone, and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we are going to cover chapter six in biology entitled A Tour of the Cell. We will be looking at the cell, what's in the cell, how we see the cell, and the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. I do ask that if you like this video and its content, that you please subscribe to my channel, share this video, like it, and comment below. If you ever have a request for a specific video, please make sure to place it in the comments. Okay, let's get started with Chapter 6, A Tour of the Cell. Cells are the fundamental units of life. All organisms are made up of cells. As a matter of fact, the cell is the simplest collection of matter that can be considered living. Since cells are usually too small to be seen by the naked eye, how can we then observe the cell and find out what a cell is made of? In order to understand the cell and what the cell is made of, we first need to talk about microscopy, how we see those cells and are able to further delve into the different components of the cell. Microscopes are needed in order to see cells and inside the cells. There are different microscopes that allow for different visualization of the cells, and we're going to be talking about several different kinds as we go through the next slides. Microscopes were invented in 1590 and continued to be further refined during the 1600s. In 1665, Robert Hooke was able to see cell walls through a microscope of dead cells from the bark of an oak tree. It wasn't until 1674 that living cells were able to be visualized underneath the microscope. This is given credit to Antony van Leeuwenhoek, who was able to craft lenses that were capable of seeing these living cells. These preliminary microscopes that were used by these scientists, as well as the microscopes that you use in your laboratory in classes, are all referred to as a light microscope. In a light microscope, as the name implies, visible light is passed through the specimen and then through the glass lenses. These lenses are used to refract or bend the light in a way that the image is magnified and then projected into the eye, or if attached, a camera. There are three important parameters of microscopy. The first is magnification. Magnification is the ratio of an object's image size to its real size. Different microscopes have different magnification capabilities depending on the objective lenses that they include. Number two is the resolution. Resolution is the measure of the clarity of the image or the minimum distance of two distinguishable points. Otherwise said, resolution is the ability to be able to see different objects from one another underneath the microscope, how well we can see one cell versus another, or even the different organelles within the cell depending on what type of microscope we're using. And thirdly is the contrast, which is the visible differences in brightness between parts of the sample. Figure 6.2 shows the size range of cells. At the top of the figure, we can see that these things can be seen with the unaided or naked eye. In this top portion, we see that the length of some nerve and muscle cells fall into that category that we can actually observe with the naked eye. However, as we go further down, we'll notice that most plant and animal cells, as well as the nucleus, most bacteria and mitochondrion, need a light microscope to be visualized. Some of the smaller things, like the mitochondrion, the nucleus, can be better seen, or the resolution is even better, in an electron microscope. The smaller we get, the more powerful microscope we are going to need in order to see those things. The image seen here is what you would commonly see underneath the light microscope. Obviously, the tissue section can vary depending on what you're looking at. This specific section has been stained with hematoxylin and eosin, or H and E, which is a very common stain used for slide preparation. In this slide, you can see the nucleus of the cells that stains the dark purple color, um, is very easy to see in here. And you can also see 
the outline of some of the cells. Depending on the tissue preparation and what exactly we're looking at, some of the cell boundaries are easier to see than others. In areas like over here, they kind of merge together. You can see the nucleus of each cell, but you can't really see the boundaries of each one. Um, in the middle here, you can kind of sometimes see the outline of the cell itself. If we were to increase the magnification on this light microscope, then you would be better able to see um, the outline of each individual cell. In fluorescent microscopy, a specialized type of light microscopy, a mercury or xenon lamp is used to produce ultraviolet light rather than the regular light that we see in light microscopy. This allows the visualization of specific molecules that can be dyed using fluorescent dyes or antibodies. When you look at these specially prepared cells underneath the fluorescent microscope, they can light up in different colors depending on the fluorescent dyes used. In the figure you are seeing right now, the blue is showing the nuclear material or the nucleus the orange is showing the mitochondria organelles and then finally you see that the skeleton of the cell is green. The confocal microscope is another type of specialized light microscopy. Like the fluorescent microscope, this technique also utilizes fluorescent dyes. However, this technique allows for a more three-dimensional analysis of the tissues. So in this case, you can not only use individual cells, like on the bottom left-hand corner, but you can also use tissue sections, as you see in the upper right-hand corner. This microscope makes use of taking two-dimensional images and sectioning through with the microscope to reconstruct these three-dimensional structures. It also eliminates out-of-focus light from a thick sample, thus producing sharp images with high resolution. The electron microscope came about in the 1950s. Rather than focusing light, as the light microscopes do, the electron microscope works by focusing a beam of electrons through the specimen or onto its surface. Since electron microscopes use electron beams, and electron beams have much shorter wavelengths than visible light, electron microscopes can achieve a much higher resolution than light microscopes. Therefore, using an electron microscope is about a hundredfold improvement over using a light microscope. In transmission electron microscopy, a beam of electrons is transmitted through an ultra-thin section of the specimen. The specimen is stained with atoms of heavy metals. These heavy metals attach to certain cellular structures. When the electrons pass through the specimen, they are scattered more in the denser region, so fewer are transmitted. This allows an image to be captured depending on the pattern of these transmitted electrons. Because of the very high magnification and resolution of these transmission electron microscopes, they are used to study the internal structure of cells. This electron micrograph of red blood cells gives you an example of what can be captured through a transmission electron microscope. You can see the red blood cells here. Something else you should probably notice is that there is very high resolution, meaning you can tell one blood cell from the other uh, very nicely. The other thing you'll notice is that this is a very 2D picture, okay? Um, and then also what you'll notice is that it is black and white. You'll see that there are darker areas versus lighter areas just depending on the transmission of those electrons. In the transmission electron microscope, we always see a two-dimensional picture. It is always black and white. If you see it colored, that's because it's been colored after the fact, um, hand-colored, uh, but they always come out black and white. 
The scanning electron microscope works similarly to the transmission electron microscope in that it is focusing a beam of electrons through the specimen. However, in the scanning electron microscope, the microscope actually scans through layers of the specimen and puts them together in order to create a three-dimensional image. Here is an example of red and white blood cells taken with a scanning electron microscope. What you should notice automatically is compared to the red blood cells I showed you before in the transmission electron microscope, you now see a three-dimensional picture. So in this case, you can see the red blood cells here with a three-dimensional shape. Again, the image is also captured in black and white. However, many you see later on colored, and that's because they were colored in again after the fact. Electron microscopy is really important because it's allowed us to visualize the outside of the cell as well as the organelles inside of the cell. This chapter, we're gonna be focusing on what makes up a cell, and we're gonna be looking at different components of the cellular membrane, as well as things inside of the cell. So how did we learn about that? How did we get to understand these things? And the electron microscope is one way in which we did that. This figure really quickly shows you how we were able to look at the cell membrane itself. Um, if you want to look through this more thoroughly, you can pause the video here, but real quickly by freezing the cell and then eventually um, coating the cell with platinum and replicating that membrane, uh, we were able to visualize um, the outer surface of the cell and look at that with electron microscopy. This technique here is um, delving in a little bit more into what I just showed you on the last slide. Again, taking off that plasma membrane, we now know that the plasma membrane is a bilayer, a phospholipid bilayer. And so by um, freezing it, taking it apart, we can see the results underneath the transmission electron microscope of the inside of that layer and then the outside uh, what that looks like. Here is a very early micrograph showing the cell membrane. We can see that the cell membrane is um, these very dark lines that are here. Uh, what you'll notice though is that this up here is one cell's membrane and this down here is another cell's membrane. So they're actually adjacent cells one to the other. Here is that same picture I just showed you, except now this has a lot better resolution and has also been colored in so that you can get an idea of what this looks like. Uh, the plasma membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, plasma membrane of one cell, and then the other cell. We can also use the microscope to look more closely at the outside of the cell itself and we can see that there are proteins that are sticking on the cell surface. Later on, we'll be talking about these different proteins that stick out of the cell surface and what their purposes are. After compiling all this data from electron microscopes uh, over many, many years, we were able to come up with what the cell membrane looks like. So now we know that the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer that has proteins on the surface, as well as proteins that transect through the entire bilayer as well. We will be talking about this more in detail as we get into the plasma membrane of the cell, but this is just so that you can get an idea of how we got into this. Um, trans the electron microscopes also allow us to look at organelles as well, and there are other methods to be able to fractionate the cells to be able to look at the individual um, organelles underneath the scope. Cells, as I had already mentioned earlier before, are the basic structural and functional units of every organism. When we talk about cells, we can talk about two distinct types of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. The major difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells is the location of the DNA. In the eukaryotic cell, we find the DNA within the nucleus. In the prokaryotic cell, 
we find it in an area referred to as the nucleoid. Now understand that the nucleoid is just where the DNA is, but it is not membrane enclosed. The term eukaryotic means true nucleus, where the term prokaryotic means before the nucleus. Prokaryotic cells therefore have no nucleus. Their DNA is in an unbound region, again called the nucleoid. They lack membrane-bound organelles. Their cytoplasm is bound by the plasma membrane, and organisms of the domains bacteria and archaea consist of prokaryotic cells. In figure 6.5, you can see a prokaryotic cell. Again, notice how the DNA is in this area. It is not bound by a nucleus, so it is not membrane bound, but it is all in one compacted area that is referred to as the nucleoid. Again, not membrane enclosed. The uh, prokaryotic cells also have this much simpler internal structure that you see here and we are going to go ahead and look at um, the eukaryotic cells so that you can see the difference between the two. So eukaryotic cells are more complex than prokaryotic cells. Their DNA is found in the nucleus which is a bound membrane they also have membrane-bound organelles, many of them. We will be talking about each one and what they do throughout the rest of this lecture. The cytoplasm is found in the region between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Eukaryotic cells are larger than prokaryotic cells. Proteins, fungi, animals, and plants all consist of eukaryotic cells. In this figure, you can see an example of a eukaryotic cell you can notice that there is a nucleus and within the nucleus is where you would find the DNA. So the DNA is therefore membrane bound with this nucleus. There are also several organelles within the eukaryotic cell, making the eukaryotic cell a much more complex cell. In the next slides, we are going to start talking about all the components that make up this eukaryotic cell. First, let's go ahead and talk about the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is a selective barrier that allows sufficient passage of oxygen, nutrients, and waste to service the volume of every cell. Therefore, the plasma membrane allows things to go in and out of the cell. The plasma membrane is a selective barrier, or we can say that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable. It only allows certain things in and out of the cell. The membrane consists of a phospholipid bilayer. These phospholipid bilayers, which you see here, two layers of phospholipids on the top and on the bottom, consist of a head. The head of the phospholipid is water-loving. They are hydrophilic and can dissolve in water, which is why they are on the outside of the cell. And then they would be also facing the inside of the cell both sides where water would be. Facing towards the inside of the phospholipid bilayer are the tail regions. The tail regions are the hydrophobic ends, which means they are afraid of water. These portions include two nonpolar fatty acids. The nucleus of the cell is information central. This organelle is the largest and most easily seen, usually in the center of the cell, though its location can vary. Within the nucleus, we will find that stored genetic material, or the DNA. Chromatin is the name given to DNA that is organized with proteins. They are stringy structures and it condenses to form chromosomes during cell division. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope itself is also composed of a 2-phospholipid bilayer, just like we saw in the cell membrane. The envelope has nuclear pores. These nuclear pores allow proteins to move into the nucleus, and RNA can move out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm. The nucleolus is located within the nucleus and is the site of ribosomal RNA or RRNA synthesis. 
Ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. We find ribosomes within the cytoplasm of the cell. You can see that ribosomes are in two different places. One attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, where you'll see the studded appearance of the endoplasmic reticulum. The other place you'll see ribosomes are just within the cytoplasm themselves. Those uh, ribosomes that are just within the cytoplasm itself are referred to as free ribosomes. So we can have free ribosomes within the cytoplasm as well as uh, ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. These ribosomes are composed of ribosomal RNA, again, rRNA, and proteins. The endomembrane system is responsible for regulating protein traffic and performing metabolic function within the cell. The endomembrane system consists of the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles, and the plasma membrane. These components are either continuous or connected via transfer by vesicles. Let's take a closer look at the rough endoplasmic reticulum. I had just mentioned the rough ER as it is studded with ribosomes. Remember, ribosomes are the sites of protein synthesis. Once these proteins are synthesized on ribosomes that are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they are exported from the cell, sent to lysosomes, or even the plasma membrane. Let's talk about the smooth ER. The smooth ER is attached to the rough ER. Uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is given its name because there are relatively few ribosomes attached to it, giving it a smooth appearance compared to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth ER has several functions and includes things such as providing a site for the synthesis of membrane lipids, it is also um, acts as a calcium storage in some cells. It can detoxify foreign substances such as alcohol, drugs, etc. Um, one of the things that you'll notice as we talk about these different organelles, all cells have all of these organelles that we're going to be talking about. However, specialized cells have more of some organelles than others depending on their specialty. Since the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, uh, one of its functions is, is to detoxify, we'll see a lot of smooth ER in liver cells because liver cells, one of their responsibilities is to detoxify substances. So we'll see a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum there. So some cells have more of some organelles than others depending on their specialties. And finally, the smooth ER also can metabolize carbohydrates. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus looks like a flattened stack of pancakes. It is often confused with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which we just talked about before, is always attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So that is kind of one of the giveaways. The other thing is that the um, Golgi apparatus kind of has this appearance, if you'll look, it looks like one stack on top of the other, whereas the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that we just looked at, that you can kind of see back here, has a more maze appearance rather than a very nice flattened stack appearance. Uh, the Golgi apparatus jobs are to modify products from the endoplasmic reticulum. It packages and distributes the materials to different parts of the cell, and it can also manufacture certain macromolecules. Lysosomes are membrane-bound vesicles that contain digestive enzymes that are used to break down macromolecules. Lysosomes are formed within the cell and packaged by the Golgi apparatus. So these digestive enzymes or proteins were made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They went to the Golgi apparatus, and then they are packaged in these vesicles that sit within the cell to be used when needed. They are also capable of destroying cells or foreign matter that the cell has engulfed in phagocytosis. So certain white blood cells that, are, um, that do phagocytosis, such as a macrophage, would have a lot more lysosomes 
uh, than other cells. Vacuoles are large vesicles that are derived from the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. There are three different types of vacuoles. There is the central vacuole that is seen in plant cells. This fills a large part of the plant cell, maintains water balance, stores pigments, ions, sugars, and waste products for the plant. Vacuoles that are most often found in animal cells are used for transporting food, water, and waste products. Food vacuoles can be formed by phagocytosis. Mitochondria are organelles that are present in all types of eukaryotic cells. They are the sites of cellular respiration, which is a metabolic process that uses oxygen to generate ATP. They have a smooth outer membrane and an inner membrane that is folded into cristae. The inner membrane creates two components, an intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix. Some metabolic steps of cellular respiration are catalyzed in the mitochondrial matrix. Cristae present a large surface area for enzymes that synthesize ATP. Mitochondria are also a unique organelle as they contain their own DNA. Chloroplasts are organelles that are present in cells of plants and some bacteria and cyanobacteria. These are the sites of photosynthesis. Chloroplasts contain green pigment chlorophyll as well as enzymes and other molecules that function in photosynthesis. Chloroplasts are found in leaves and other green organs of plants and in algae. The chloroplast has three parts. The thylakoid membrane, these are areas of concentrated chlorophyll. The grana, these are stacks of coin-shaped thylakoids. And finally, the stroma, which is the fluid-filled spaces of enzymes in between grana. Mitochondria and chloroplasts both generate ATP. Peroxisomes are specialized metabolic compartments bounded by a single membrane. They break down hydrogen peroxide and convert it into water. Peroxisomes perform reactions with many different functions. Some peroxisomes can use oxygen to break fatty acids down into smaller molecules, while peroxisomes in the liver detoxify alcohol and other harmful compounds by transferring hydrogen from the poisonous compounds to oxygen. The cytoskeleton of the cell is a network of fibers extending throughout the cytoplasm. It organizes the cell's structures and activities, anchoring many organelles to the cell itself. It is composed of three types of molecular structures, microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. The role of the cytoskeleton is to support the cell and also for motility in those cells that are able to be mobile. This table shows the difference between microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. If you want to go ahead and pause the video here to look at it in more detail, you can. I'm going to briefly talk about each one. Microtubules are responsible for facilitating cell movement. They organize the cytoplasm and move materials within the cell. They are the thickest of all the tubules. They are also involved in maintaining the cell shape. Microfilaments or actin filaments are responsible for cellular contractions and pinching during division. They also help in the maintenance of cell shape and work in muscle contraction. These filaments are the thinnest of all the filaments. And finally are the intermediate filaments. Again, these work in maintenance of cell shape and they provide structural stability. The centrosomes and centrioles are present in most animal cells and proteases, but not plant cells. In animal cells, microtubules grow out from a centrosome near the nucleus, and it's used in cell division. The centrosome consists of both centrioles at a 90 degree angle. The centrosome has a pair of centrioles, each with nine triplets of microtubules 
arranged in a ring. Cell movement can take different forms. Crawling is accomplished via actin filaments and the protein myosin. Flagella undulate to move a cell. Cilia can be arranged in rows on a surface uh, of a eukaryotic cell to propel a cell forward. The cilia and flagella of eukaryotic cells have a similar structure. They have nine pairs of microtubules surrounded by two central microtubules. This is a nine to two structure. Cilia are usually more numerous than flagella on a cell. Here's an example of what um, a flagella looks like versus what cilia look like. The cell wall of plants is an extracellular structure that distinguishes plant cells from animal cells. Prokaryotes, fungi, and some unicellular eukaryotes have cell walls. The cell wall protects the plant, maintains its shape, and prevents excessive uptake of water. Plant cells are made of cellulose fibers embedded in other polysaccharides and protein. Plant cell walls have multiple layers. The primary cell wall is relatively thin and flexible. The middle lamella is a thin layer between the primary walls of adjacent cells. And the secondary cell wall in some cells is added between the plasma membrane and the primary cell wall. In a plant cell, the cell wall would be on the outside and the plasma membrane would be on the inside of that cell wall. So the cell wall adds another layer of protection for the plant cell itself. Animal cells lack cell walls, but are covered by an elaborate extracellular matrix or ECM. The extracellular matrix is made up of glycoproteins such as collagen, proteoglycans, and fibronectin. The extracellular matrix proteins bind to receptor proteins in the plasma membrane called integrins. The extracellular matrix has an influential role in the lives of cells. They can regulate a cell's behavior by communicating with a cell through integrins. There are three types of cell junctions that are common in epithelial tissues. At tight junctions, which you see here, the membranes of neighboring cells are pressed together, preventing leakage of extracellular fluid. So they are very tightly held together here. In desmosomes or anchoring junctions, which you see here, these fasten the cells together into strong sheets. Again, remember that these junctions are cell to cell junctions. So plasma membrane to plasma membrane. And finally, gap junctions, seen here, provide cytoplasmic channels between adjacent cells. So these are actually acting as channels. This concludes my lecture on Chapter 6, A Tour of the Cell. I do hope that this helped you to understand the different concepts in this chapter. If you have any questions about this, please don't hesitate to write them in the comments below. If you like this video and its content, I please ask that you subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Thank you.